John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11 says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? It's a wonderful promise. The third candle of Advent today is the, is the candle of joy, and it reminds us the joy that Mary felt when the angel Gabriel told her that a special child was going to be born. A child who would save and deliver his people. God wants all of us to have that joy and experience that same joy. And as we read in the scripture that the angels who announced to the shepherds that Jesus had been born and told them not to be afraid because they were only bringing, them, bringing to them good news of great joy to all. Not to some, but to all. That was great joy they spoke of. That great joy was a direct result of the birth that took place. The birth of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we light this candle today to remember that Christ brings the promise of a new life. And that, my friends, is the joy unspeakable that we're talking about. That brings joy to your life. A life in which the blind receive sight, the lame walk, prisoners are set free. We light it to remember that he is the bringer of true everlasting joy. Father, we thank you for the joy that you bring in our lives. We pray today that you would help us not to focus on what we don't have, but instead that we focus and experience joy as we look what you have blessed at, what you have blessed us with that you have blessed our lives tremendously. Help us to prepare our hearts for the joy that you want to bring in our lives during this Christmas season. And may our worship be a blessing to you, and may we hear and do as your word instructs us. And we ask this in the name of the Savior, the Christ child, the Messiah, born in Bethlehem. Amen. Amen. So we continue... Uh, Hey, you know what? Before we get rolling today, I wanna, uh, there's a couple things I want to I wanna remind you. Is that okay? Is that th this morning, there was, a, I know this is, this is off, but we'll, we'll get going here in just a second. The, the, our youth ministry, the teens, were wrapping presents this morning. Some of you may be aware of that. Some of you don't. They were doing it as a fundraiser. And uh, how ironic, youth ministry and fundraising, huh? I spent 18 years doing youth ministry. I felt like I was a professional fundraiser. But, hey, that's okay. Uh, they have this little thing coming up in, uh, in about a year and a half called NYC, um, Nazarene Youth Conference. It's a major event. It's in Phoenix, Arizona. And it's a wonderful event for uh, our teens to participate in. It's a great teaching event. It's a very spiritual uh, event. There will be speakers uh, that will, will be coming in to preach the word to them. They'll have service opportunities where they'll be serving others. But anyway, so they're beginning the fundraising process of doing that. So if you didn't have uh, gifts that you have, uh, uh, you knew about this, to let them wrap, they'll still accept your donation if you'd like to donate and, uh, to them. If you have gifts, you can ask, and maybe they could still wrap some this evening. I don't know, but... Uh, um, anyway, it's a, it's a great cause, all right? So if you'd like to participate in that and, or make a donation. And then next week, I want to remind you that it is Christmas Eve, right? And so it'll be a very special time for us. Our children's ministry will be um, doing a Christmas program for us on that Sunday morning. You will not want to miss it. It's going to be a very special time. And um, so... Please plan now to be here uh, next Sunday morning and spend your Christmas Eve with us. And then later that evening at 6 p.m., we'll have a Christmas Eve service and um, carols and candlelight. And we would encourage you to be a part of that that evening from 6 to 7. 
I always say if you uh, will promise and commit to, to being here and being in that time, I will promise and commit to only keeping you an hour. But that's a big deal for me. <laughs> you know, uh, so we would, we would love to, uh, what, and, and I will tell you, it'll be a beautiful way to celebrate, to take an hour out of your day and your evening to come and to celebrate together on Christmas Eve. And then uh, immediately following the service, I'm going to be taking off like uh, a lot quicker than normal because I have to beat, uh, I have to be home and be able to beat senior adults because they move pretty fast sometimes, all right? We are having a Christmas luncheon with senior adults. We're hosting them in our, in our house today, a Christmas gathering. So um, I'm going to run out of here and, and beat them to my house. Is that a, so everybody's okay with that. So I won't be hanging out as long as normal. I just wanted to let you know that. So Advent, um, have you been thinking about this as we've been going along, Advent and what, what it is? And um, just to, I, I want to say this every week, we're doing this series so that you know, if you haven't written it down, you will, or you'll remember the more times you hear it. But the word Advent means the coming or arrival, coming or arrival. And the, the focus on, on the entire season is the celebration of the birth of Jesus in the, that very first Advent, right? And the preparation and then the anticipation of the celebration of Christ returning the, uh, and would be the second Advent. And see, it's much more. Advent is much more. If, and if you remember anything, remember this. It's not just simply a 2,000-year-old event in our history. It is a celebration of the truth about God and his love, and his peace, and hope, and joy. It's a celebration of the truth, the revelation of God in Christ, and where all creation is reconciled with him. So God put this hope in our hearts for a child. You've had hope before, right? We've all had hope in our hearts. So we put this hope in our hearts for a child. Remember the story I shared with you last week about our, our, our own daughter and the hope that he put in our hearts. And then we began the preparation for her arrival, right? Um, and then a peace began to settle. Once we, we, had, we had that hope, and then we began the preparation, and a peace began to settle in around us. Why? Because we knew we were chosen to be a part of God's plan for our life. And so when you're chosen and you're obedient and you accept your role in God's plan for your life, then a peace will settle in around you because everything is coming together according to God. You see, there, but there was much more to come as our, our hearts began to be filled with the joy that only a child can bring. And so we knew this Personally, we knew this. If you remember the story from last week, we knew this because we already had children ahead of her. So we had experienced joy before, all right? And so I don't want anyone to say, well, you know, he's only preaching to parents today, all right? So that's not the case because you may not have children of your own, but I'm pretty sure that even if you don't, you've probably held a child before, right? Maybe it's someone else's. Maybe it's a you know, it's a, a foster child or an adopted child. Maybe it's a, a child of a friend that, that uh, you have witnessed uh, the birth and you've had an opportunity to hold that child. There's no other joy like holding a child. Wouldn't you agree? It just brings this joy to your life, to your heart. And so it started with hope. And hope, what is hope? It's to cherish and, or desire and expectation or a fulfillment, and to long for and expect with desire and trust. That's a hope. And so we prayed, we prayed, and we prayed again, and it was confirmed that we were to proceed from that, that period of hope where we just had this hope that it would happen in our hearts. So it was hope that we would have this child, and this child would come into our lives, and it was, then it was confirmed that we were to proceed from hope to begin preparation and you see, it was funny because it was like we were getting to live out the Advent. So we began to prepare for her, and then we began to anticipate her arrival, which then began to bring peace to our hearts. Our home and our family began to change as we, as we prepared by making all the necessary changes in our, in our life and 
everything that this was going to impact, our life, our home, our, our, our family, our finances, our ministry, and, and uh, all of that stuff was just like blown up, right? And it was all going to change everything from, you know, from buying a new home because at the time when this, when this happened is, and, and we began this process and God put this hope in our heart and then we began to prepare and, and then we began to expect and then this peace settled in. And, but everything began to change. We lived in a, in a home. We lived in a parsonage at the time and uh, a home very, very close to the, to the church and a home that the, the church owned. And we realized very early on that if we were going to proceed with this, that one of the, thing, one of the roadblocks, one of the stumbling blocks was, was that the, the home we lived in, the parsonage, was just not big enough. And so uh, one of the things that we were told, well, the home that you live in doesn't have enough square footage. And so, you're, you know, you, you can't have this child. And so that was the first thing that had to change. We had to find a home to buy and then update it and being in and out of court for various legal proceedings, wiping out our, our, uh, our entire retirement and savings. But the joy that filled our hearts when we held her and we had the opportunity to protect her and we dreamed about her life like it was no other. And we couldn't help but imagine how Mary and Joseph must have felt as they held him for the first time. Hmm. Have you ever thought about that? In their arms, they didn't just hold any baby. <laughs> they held the baby. They held the Savior of the world. So Mary's going back. Mary's visit with Elizabeth, uh, again, um, the excitement and the joy she felt uh, and, and that she portrayed, and she, she dispersed this joy because the baby in, uh, leaped in the womb of Elizabeth when he heard Mary's voice. Elizabeth was delighted to see what God had done in her life. Mary responded in worship. How else would you respond in worship? So much that her soul, the Scripture says, her soul glorified her God. Her soul was at peace with all that was going on and the prophecy surrounding John the Baptist and his birth and the, and the focus on Zechariah. Today, we're going to examine three, three things again. The events that surrounded the prophecy of the birth of Jesus. And I want to read this to you. Luke chapter 1. We're going to go back to Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. And I'm reading to you out of the New Living Translation. Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. Here we go. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Here's his famous words. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. I can't help but think that's, that's, well, that's where it started with her. When it was confirmed and she was assured, you have found favor with God, Mary. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy. And he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but now she is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> Just in case you wondered how all this happened. For nothing, nothing is impossible with God. Hmm. 
Hmm. I love her response, don't you? Did you read ahead of me? Absolutely love her response. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Did she understand everything that had been said about her? I think so. Wow. What a young lady, huh? Because her, her response was, may everything you have said about me come true. Most of us would be, would be going, are you kidding me? <laughs> Please don't make that true. I don't want that responsibility. But Mary, but Mary, may everything you said about me be true. Hmm. I love that. That's joy, my friends. Don't you think? The first, and that's the first thing we're going to take note of. The first thing is the joy that took place in Mary's encounter with this angel, in Ga uh, the angel Gabriel and the prophecy that happened. Verses 26 through 28. 26 through 28, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's, uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to a, a village in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. This sets the tone for the story. This sets the tone for the story, for the encounter, and it's extremely important for us to grasp this because this is the beginning. This was the first time she heard, you are favored. You are favored in God's eyes. Isaiah 9, 7 says, of the, greatness of, his, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. And the only way to reign on a, uh, on a throne was to be from the same lineage, okay? That was the only way, to be from the, from, to be from the same lineage, to be from the right lineage, and to be, uh, uh, this was stressed and it was important in the genealogy of, of, of Jesus himself. You see, Joseph, Joseph was in line, was in the line of King David, and he, ha and he held a legal right to the throne, but he descended from Jaconus, and he would have been disqualified by God from taking the throne. And you can read the whole in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 13, I believe it is. Verses 1 through 13, or 1 through 17, I'm sorry. Matthew 1, 1 through 17. You can read about the lineage of Jesus. And you can see where Joseph fell in that. And so I, wanna, I want to, uh, to grab a couple of those for you this morning in Matthew Chapter 1, okay, verse 1. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham, all right? And then you can go on and you can read the whole lineage. And uh, verse 16, we're going to skip down to verse 16. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. All those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. Mary, however, was of the tribe of Judah and the, and the lineage of David. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give him unto the throne the father of David. That's what the word says. And the same angel that appeared to Zechariah, remember that story? Remember the story of Zechariah a couple weeks ago? The same angel that appeared to Zechariah appeared to Mary. And remember his response. Zechariah was what? He was a man. He was a churchman, right? He was in church, right? He was in the temple. He was in church. He was doing church things. Being a good churchman like we all like to be, correct? But he missed it. Remember? He missed it because he had doubts. And what was his punishment? He couldn't speak for six months. Can you remember? You remember that? That would be terrible, wouldn't it, for some of us? I'd have a hard time with six minutes. 
But Mary was a woman who found favor with God. She found the joy in God, and she didn't doubt at any time what God was up to. And there's some truth here about how we approach God with the right heart. And you see, initially, Zechariah had, had, had scoffed at Gabriel, while Mary's heart and her encounter with Gabriel was quite different. So what's the point? The point is, is that when your heart, when our heart is right with God, it is then that we will find favor with God. Let me say that again. It, when our heart is right with God, it is then we will find favor with God, and it is then we will experience the joy that only He provides. The second thing today is that we're going to talk about is the finding favor and the joy with God. And you'll find that in verses 29 through 33. Finding favor and joy with God. You see, Mary appeared troubled right? Mary appeared troubled, and, and perhaps it was just a look on her face. I mean, she was a young teenage uh, girl, and so I can't help but um, imagine that she, there was some troubling concept to this in her mind and her heart, that, that feeling like, why am I being chosen for this? So it could have been a look on her face, but the response from God's angels is one of extreme comfort and joy. He says, do not be afraid, Mary. I love that when he says that to us, don't you? There have been times in my life where he says, do not be afraid, Brad. Has he said that to you? Do not be afraid because you've found favor with God. How many times has God told people in the Bible to not be afraid? Sometimes it just, it just overwhelms us. Sometimes we're overwhelmed with fear and we're going through a particular circumstance or a, perf a particular time in our life and, or dealing with a specific issue and then we're just overwhelmed with fear. We're consumed with fear. But, but God, in his infinite wisdom and love and care for us, says, do not be afraid because you have favor with me. Joshua 1, 6 through 9 says, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And wherever you go means not only wherever you go physically, but wherever you go in your mind, wherever you go spiritually, whatever you're going through, is you have this promise, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever, whatever, whenever. 1 John 4.18 says, The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. When God gives us a word to take comfort in, we should immediately grab it. No matter what the situation, no matter what the challenge, no matter what we're going through, if he says it, then his promise is that it will be done. And see, here we have the greatest revelation to mankind is about to be made, is about to take place. And what does he say? Do not be afraid. She had to be overwhelmed with fear in her mind, don't you think? She's about to become the, the, the biggest part of the greatest story ever told to mankind. And he says, do not be afraid. You see, the promise of this child that was going to be born and that he will reign over Israel the angel tells Mary that her child will be what? The Messiah. This is not going to be just any child, Mary. This is going to be the Messiah. And oh, what joy had to be in that moment. The final thing today that I want you to take note of is the joy in following God completely. A full surrender, if you will a complete surrender, to find joy. And you'll find that in verses, go back, I'm not going to read them to you, but verses 34 through 38. 34 through 38. The joy in following God completely. Have you ever gotten caught up in, in so caught up in the details of what you're going through, of life and the situation and, and, and the event that you're going through, that you miss what God's trying to do? Mary was totally human. She was an average person, just like you and I. She simply expressed a concern over the details when she asked, how can, this, how can this be? How can this take place? I'm a virgin. Mary was human in her thinking, 
but she was also a righteous woman in God's eyes. And so she was chosen to give birth to the Messiah, fulfilling a promise from the entire Old Testament. How about you and I? When God reveals something to us, do we find ourselves often just too busy with the details and inserting our own ideas and our own plans and our own agenda and our own schedules during the conversation with God that we simply miss it? We miss the joy that he wants to provide for us. And see, even in her current state, and she had to be overwhelmed with fear about what was happening to her about her encounter with the angel, about what was being said to her because she was a teenager. But see, God explains to her how it will all come to pass. And I believe in, in Luke 1, 35 through 38, Mary, Mary gets it. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. Well, what's more, your relative Elizabeth has come, become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's now in her sixth month for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary responded. What would happen when God calls us and our response would be, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Hmm. Mary gets it. When God speaks to us and he says something is going to be done, the only response, the only, the only thing that we should have, that we should respond in saying to him is, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Fill me with your joy. And give me opportunities to then share it and dispense it to others. You see, the angel gave her the bonus information about her friend Elizabeth being pregnant. And showing them why Mary went to see her. It was then the confirmation of what God was doing and, and, and receiving. And the joy that settled what she was receiving and the joy that settled in her heart forever at that moment when she was told that she had favor with God. The last thing I want to let you know today is that what we can take from this story is that the angel told her that it was the Holy Spirit that would come upon her, right? The Holy Spirit would come upon her. So if there's any doubt ever about the power of the Holy Spirit would, that we have access to as believers, one only needs to look at this story. And to reread this story and to see the importance and the power of the Holy Spirit that took place in Mary's life. We have an amazing opportunity to hear about the joy of the Messiah in this story and that he, that he found favor with Mary and the joy that he provided with her and to her. We have the opportunity to, to hear and to read and to receive the good news of this story. We have the same opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit that took place in that setting. You see, the good news is that Jesus was born not just to be born, not just to be any baby, but so that he can live, he could live and then die for our sins. So don't get so caught up in the details that we miss the main event. You see, the same, the same spirit that gave Mary the joy of a child is the same spirit that wants to give us that same joy for God's glory. Here was Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. What's our response? What's our response? Let's pray.